Early on Sunday morning, while it is still dark, Mary Magdalene makes her way to the tomb where Jesus has been buried in the garden of Joseph of Arimathea. John describes this incredible morning in the 20th chapter of his gospel record. The first rays of the sun are, are breaking the horizon as the light of the, the new week slowly disperses the darkness. And in the departing shadows, something strange reveals itself. The guards who were left to secure the tomb are nowhere to be found. The large stone that had been used to seal the sepulchre has been rolled to the side, revealing a dark abyss inside. And in shock and, and disbelief, Mary makes her way to the tomb and looks inside. The tomb is empty. In her distress, she immediately runs back to tell the disciples what she has found. In this incredible story, Mary is the key character, but she would essentially say the same thing in the story three times. A question she never receives a verbal answer for. And a question that I want us to think about in this short meditation. They have taken my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. It was a reasonable conclusion given the evidence presented to her. If a dead body is no longer in its grave, it is obvious that someone must have taken the body and that they would need to have lain it somewhere because dead bodies lie down. And there's something to really pay attention to here in the words they used. Because one of the truly distinct characteristics of human beings is that we are uniquely the living creatures that stand upright. No other creature stands like us. That's, that's our great differentiator. Even our closest relatives, according to the scientists, are unable to stand as we are. And when we die, like all the other beasts that perish, we lie down. We lose that unique ability to stand upright. My Lord is dead. I don't know where they have laid him. And so she then returns back with the disciples to the tomb. First Peter and then John look inside and they seemingly bolt back to, to the rest of the disciples to confirm Mary's discovery. Mary returns back to the open tomb and this time she summons a little more courage and actually looks intently into the tomb. The body of Jesus is still missing. The grave clothes are still there. It is just the body that is missing. But the tomb is not empty. There are two angels that are inside the tomb. For some reason, this strange encounter of itself does not seem to, to startle Mary. Perhaps in her state of panic and confusion, she did not even recognize them as angels, despite their white, dazzling appearance. But the more likely explanation is that she is so focused on finding her Lord she has eyes only for him, even the appearance of these two angels in dazzling white does not distract her from her purpose. Why are you crying? They ask her. And she repeats that same statement or question that we referred to, to, to before, exactly the same line she had shared with the disciples. They have taken my Lord and I don't know where they have lain him. Almost exactly the same. For the first time she said to them, the Lord. Now she says, my Lord. There's something more personal in her loss. This is my Lord. He has been taken by someone. He has been laid down somewhere. Mary then turns to, to leave the tomb. And almost immediately in front of her, perhaps in that moment, she turns from gaze into the thick darkness of the tomb. She is confronted with the bright sun rays of the rising dawn and, and, and she can't quite clearly make out who it is that is in front of her. But someone is standing in front of her and she is still crying because the man says to her a very similar question to the question that the angels asked of her. Dear woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Jesus adds just that extra question. Who are you looking for? And it's a somewhat leading question, isn't it? Because it, it, it is not unusual to find someone crying in a, in, in a cemetery. You, you, you cry because you have lost someone you have loved. You are not looking for them. 
You know that they are dead. You know that they are gone. You are crying because uh, they are dead. But she was crying because Jesus was missing. There is a sense that you will not find the risen Lord unless you are looking for him. Millions wake up every morning with not the slightest realization or recognition that Jesus Christ is risen, that he is alive and that he is available. They are not looking for him. And for them, he remains in a tomb, lost in the annals of history. But this morning, we have come looking for him. And for the third time, Mary says the same thing. They have taken my Lord and I don't know where they have laid him. Three times someone has taken my Lord and they have laid him somewhere. Each time, no one will answer the question, where have they laid him? Not the disciples, not the angels, and now the gardener. Yes, you see, they are in a garden. And she supposes him to be the gardener. Isn't it remarkable? Here they are in a garden. The synchronicity of all that is going on here as she is about to have this incredible creation revealed to her. Mary. There is the answer. Why is the, that, that single word spoken by Jesus is so powerful. Why is it that centuries later that one word still sends sensations into each and every one of us as we hear it echoed throughout the centuries of time? Mary. Some say it was the shortest sermon Jesus ever gave. Here's a powerful thought. Resurrection is first revealed in recognition. It's an incredible idea. The resurrection is about a life to come that has familiarity with what we've experienced today. Jesus proved that he was alive by first calling the name of one of his disciples. No one has taken me, Mary, and I am not lying down. I am alive. I am standing up. I am risen from the dead. There is your answer, not in words, but in the reality of my presence. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. In a garden 4,000 years before, the gardener had been banished from the garden because he failed to live up to the responsibility that God had given him. Adam failed to dress and keep the garden. He and his wife Eve were expelled from the garden, kept away by two flaming cherubim. Now, in this garden, the true gardener has returned. He has kept the garden, and he comes to call his bride, Mary. In a sense, this encounter is a great echo to the day when we shall all be called by the, as a bride of Christ to meet our risen Lord. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming when all who are in the grave will hear his voice. What will we hear? Just your name, Mary. Rabboni. Rabboni. There is a scarcity of words, isn't there, in this great reunion. The first conversation between the risen Lord and his disciple consists of just two words, the least amount of words that can constitute a conversation. Mary, Rabboni. And at last, they are connected. John records that she turned herself and said, Rabboni. And it's a small piece of detail, but you would have remembered that she John has already recorded that she had turned from the tomb and saw Jesus. And he uses the same word now to say that she turned and faced Jesus. Why did she need to turn again? Perhaps we can assume that she had moved away from Jesus before he said Mary. And John just fails to record this, this detail. Perhaps. 
But John is, is far more intricate, isn't he? And intimate in his descriptions throughout the gospel and every detail matters. I'm not sure he would have left that out. Surely this was a different type of turning. A turning of someone undergoing a full and complete enlightenment. The turning in which all darkness and chaos and distress in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, is turned into light and order and joy. That is real turning. Rabboni! There are many potential interpretations for this word. It's obviously closely related to the word rabbi, which we know means teacher and was often used as a title for Jesus. Some scholars, and, and I, I like this, believe that Rabboni comes with a more personal characteristic, a relationship with the teacher, the idea of my teacher, my master, Rabboni. His greeting, in other words, to return by an old friend with a name that she had probably called him so many times before. I'm sure it would have fallen on his ears too, like the warmth of an old friend's embrace. Old friends united again, just like old times. And yet not at all, because now the friendship can never be broken by death. Her choice of greeting, as we've said before, is not the language of faith, but of reunion. And I think this is such an important revelation of resurrection. The reality of people who once walked a road together in these bodies with all their experiences, their names and terms of affection reunited together. This is the reality of resurrection that has been revealed to us. And she throws herself at him, embracing him. And he's there. He's a real body. The text in John does not specifically say that she, she, she embraced him, but it's implied when Jesus says to her, do not cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. The, the, the word cling means don't hold me back. She grabs him. He, he is physical. He is there for real. He says in another place in Luke chapter 24, Behold my hands and my feet that it is I myself, and handle me, and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see me have. The word resurrection in the Greek is a fantastic word. It is the word Anastasia. It has a very literal sense. It means to, to stand up. You see, this is the idea. Dead men, as we said at the beginning, lie down. Dead bodies, as Mary has said, are laying down. This man is standing up. He is literally upright. He is alive. He is very real. What are we to take from all this? Our faith is real. It is grounded in the physical. The body is spiritual. It is, it is a quickening spirit, but it is the integration of physical and spiritual. We're not caught to something altogether mystical and beyond our comprehension. But if there is to be no resurrection of the dead, Paul says, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain, and your faith is also in vain. But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the firstfruits of them that slept. This is all very real. Not just invisible and mystical. Not, not just spiritual at the demise of the physical. What stands before Mary, you see, is a new creation. A new mode of being, never seen before. Not since the first creation had taken place in Genesis 1 is there a new creation such as this, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living creature. The last Adam was made a life-giving spirit. A perfect integration of Adama, the, 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 the red earth and the life giving spirit. This is our hope. The hope that is revealed to us in a standing saviour. One who is no longer lying down. The hope to stand together with him one day in the garden of the promised land. The hope to hear his name and to have a conversation as we are united together with all of those we love and long to see. This is the hope of the resurrection.